Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. Additional funding provided by the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation. I love making my patients happy. It's giving love away. They're always telling me that I'm their favorite nurse. My residents are very grateful. It makes me want to keep going. The Research Foundation for SUNY. People, infrastructure, and technology make SUNY research an engine for New York's innovation economy. www.rfsuny.org. Winner of a New York State Emmy for Best Political Program, this is New York Now. Hi, and welcome to New York Now. I'm Casey Seiler from the Times Union. We're starting the show to talk of crime punishment and ongoing investigations at the Reporters' Roundtable this week, where I am happy to be joined by Karen DeWitt of New York State Public Radio, Rick Carlin from my own paper, The Times Union, and, of course, my partner here at New York Now, Matt Ryan. All right, before we start, let me offer a primer of sorts on what we know now. We're talking Friday morning, two weeks into the investigation, or our understanding of the investigation of what is going on with Joe Prococo, former top aide, deputy executive, uh, executive secretary to Governor Andrew Cuomo. Now, what the administration is saying is that there is an ongoing investigation by the Office of U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, Preet Bharara, into uh, undisclosed conflicts, potential undisclosed conflicts of interest that might have resulted in the state being defrauded in terms of upstate development deals. Um, uh, there is a separate investigation, an independent investigation that the administration is paying for, taxpayers are paying for. It's going to be done by Bart Schwartz, a former employee of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District under Rudy Giuliani. What Preet Bharara's office is saying is nothing. What has been leaked out is information about the subpoena that was dropped two weeks ago on the administration. And that tells us a little bit more, provides a little bit more of a map as to where the U.S. Attorney's investigation is going. It seeks information about actions taken by a half dozen members of the administration. Joe Prococo, aide Andrew Kennedy, who worked on development deals, State Director of Operations Jim Malatris, Bill Mulrow, the governor's secretary, Peter Cutler, a former spokesperson now gone from the administration who worked on development projects, and Gil Quinones, who's the head of the New York Power Authority, seeking information about actions they might have taken to the benefit of about 20 companies. Many of those companies involved in upstate development, many of those companies generous donors to the governor's campaign. No one it's very important to say, has been charged with any wrongdoing at this point. Um, that being said, it's clear that the investigation is also looking at a lobbyist of sorts, and we can get into that, named Todd Howe, who has been associated with the governor going back to the days of Mario Cuomo, including his service at HUD. The aforementioned Mr. Howe represented many of the companies that are enumerated in the subpoena. All right, I'm done. That's right. Very good. Very good summary. The only per other, per other person I would mention, maybe of interest, is Dr. Elaine Calieros, the head of SUNY Polytechnic, currently the highest-paid employee in New York State government, who seemed to be at the center of a lot of the Buffalo Billion deals, and that was revealed, I think, last September that there were subpoenas yeah, out September. about that. Once again, he hasn't been charged with anything or accused of anything, but they are looking at him as another major figure the, the, as the well. Nano, the, he's, he's, he basically created the nanotechnology college at SUNY, and they now are building campuses all across upstate, up and down the, the Mohawk Valley, out to Buffalo. And that's a big, really a centerpiece of the governor's upstate revival efforts, including the Beth Buffalo Billion. So he, he's, he's integral to that. Yeah, big public-private kind yeah. of partnership. Oh, okay, you just yeah, used a phrase that's very much of interest here, a public-private mm -hmm. partnership, yes. which that's, we hear a lot about that. The governor is very fond of those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Is this, I mean, can it be said, I don't mean to be glib, that what is potentially at work here might be a slightly darker public-private mm -hmm. partnership. Absolutely. I mean, that's the question. Was this whole thing pay to play? Did these developers give big donations in exchange to get the contracts for these economic development projects? And that seems to be, I think, the larger picture 
of what Preet Bharara is looking at. Though Governor Cuomo is kind of spitting it as it's these couple of bad apples, mm -hmm. he's essentially disowned them, and they might have done something wrong, but everybody else was, was, was you know, acting but, in the right. Yeah, potentially innocent yeah. bystanders or yeah. merely witnesses, witnesses here. The, the said, potential yeah. would be, if, it, if worse came to worse, you would just call it old-fashioned bid rigging for, for big construction projects that are, are paid for with, with tax dollars. Time-honored New York tradition. Yes, right? going, going back to the days of Tammany Hall, if not further back. Well, when we talked about last in last week's show, uh, the news of Joe, Joe Prococo, who was Andrew Cuomo's right-hand man for many, many years, and that's really kind of the salacious part of the story. If and Casey, you can talk maybe a little bit about your interaction with, with Andrew Cuomo this week at a, an event he had in the Adirondacks. Um, why didn't Cuomo vet him more when he left uh, his, his state government? Role? Right. At a, at, up in the Adirondacks, um, the governor, I give him credit, he answered about 20 minutes of questions, many of them on this mm -hmm. investigation. And the question that I put to him was, do you regret not asking Joe Prococo when he, uh, he uh, the governor has said that he knew that Prococo, he was informed that Prococo might take on private clients mm -hmm. when he left the administration in April of 2014 to become the governor's campaign manager. Governor, do you have regrets that you didn't ask Joe Prococo who his private clients were when he returned from being your campaign manager to the administration? Uh, no, you know, the uh, there are rules. People know the rules. Uh, they're very clear. They're very precise and people should follow the rules. Now, we don't know for sure that someone hasn't followed the rules yet, uh, and that's what the investigations are all about. We'll get the facts, but if someone violated the rules and the policies, then uh, they have to pay the price. But just you sure. as a manager, do you think it was incumbent upon you to find out who he might have worked for and whether those people had business before the state? No. You know, the state has uh, tens of thousands of employees. They're not supposed to be, uh, um, they're, they're not supposed to be cross-examined to make sure they're following the rules seems oddly incurious about something that could potentially blow up in his face as it is. If, you, if your employee is leaving and says, I'm going to take on consultant, you know, I'm in consulting firms, you would say, well, who, who are you going to consult with? Are these firms going to conflict with anything we do? Or just say, you know, I, I hope that you wouldn't do that or something like that. And also it the just governor... seems odd that you would just say, oh, go ahead, do whatever you need to do. Yeah. To, you know, I don't need to know about it. But that's not, the governor's known as a micromanager, yeah, for, yes. according to a lot of people. Yeah. And he, he likes to know the details and, and, and even make decisions on some details that another governor might delegate to someone else. So that seems to be, be a little bit in conflict. This, this wasn't some guy in an that. agency, yeah. right. you know, uh, many, many uh, miles away. This, yeah. was, this, was, this was his guy. This was his his father's third son. That's they right. Said many times. Yeah, very more, very close. More to the than family. just some other yeah. state employee yeah. or even somebody who worked in the council's office. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Joe Prococo, in many ways, was the governor's alter ego. Yeah. In you were many talking cases. to him. Is that you fair? were talking to the governor. Yeah, right. yeah. That's that's a good way of putting it. He would, and he would be kind of the hatchet man for him, maybe saying things that Cuomo didn't always want to say directly to people. So they were very close, and everyone he would reach knows out that. To, but he's. To, yeah. But Cuomo's definitely distanced himself from him at this point. And, and uh, is it fair to say that he's also distancing himself from Todd Howe, a guy <laughs> fair, who, yeah. who worked who worked on his campaign? Apparently, according to a very good story that Jimmy Vilkind did in uh, in Politico earlier this week, you know, was responsible for bringing a lot of money to the campaign as well. He has now been he is no longer working for. Whiteman, uh, uh, Osterman, Hanna, who is the powerful uh, capital region law firm. He was running a subsidiary uh, of them. Todd Howe was in D.C. It looks like that subsidiary has now gone away as well. Um, uh, the governor says, we're not close friends. Yeah. We would see each other at events. Yeah, he said, well, we were close. We'd see each other at events. He didn't mention that one of the events was this intimate fundraising dinner where there were only a few people at it. But he was trying to distance himself from... Todd Howe. I don't know how well it's going to work because that just generated more news stories showing that they uh, were close, including one in, in the New York Post this morning that claims that Todd Howe was the secret hand model for Mario Cuomo's portrait because they needed a model of hands and he rushed down to the artist's studio and modeled the hands for that. That portrait, the artist which was is in Maryland, just, and of course yeah. he was based in DC. Right. And which so. is like, well, so you just cannot make up yeah. these these things. And I should would, say the post did source it from Facebook posts. Yes. Yeah. 
but they did yeah. talk to the artist who confirmed that he had uh, come there. There was a story earlier in the week about Todd Howe and his finances. He has, he's left a long trail of unpaid debts and, and a, I believe a bankruptcy well, and even a, in a, a check fraud case. And the, the New York and Times apparently has had reported a lot that of story out. Yeah. Yeah, financial that's difficulties, which makes you wonder, is he more open to cutting corners or yeah, something. Yeah, that's yeah. a very that's a very good point. Yeah. He wrote a bad check he, for forty five thousand yeah. dollars and was convicted of a felony and the governor said he didn't know anything about that because right. he wasn't close to Todd House, so he didn't know it, about his finances. It, it, it seems like sometimes these guys get in over their head financially. Also with Prococo, he had gotten a very favorable mortgage for, I believe it was an $800,000 home. In Westchester. In Westchester, yeah, they all feel it. like they're in a certain circle. All of a sudden they have to have the big house in Westchester. They have to have the thousand mm -hmm. dollar suit. And, and can they really afford it? He wasn't making uh, on, that on, on much money. On a state money. government yeah. salary. He was it, making it's not what? super, super big money, yeah. yeah this, he was making like $150,000, uh, yeah, which is a lot, but if you have an $800,000 house. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's shift yeah. our attention now yeah. <laughs> from from uh, Westchester to another uh, downstate suburb which is Long Island and another branch of government which is uh, the state Senate where Dean Skelis of course the former Republican leader was sentenced on Thursday to five years his son sentenced to six and a half years uh, in a case also brought by Preet Bharara uh, eight felony counts they were found guilty of for essentially, as the as the uh, prosecutors put it, trying to monetize Dean Skelis's uh, legislative power to the benefit of the son. Yeah, the second uh, legislative leader mm -hmm. in ten days, which is really pretty astounding. The form, two former legislative leaders now presumably headed to prison unless they mm -hmm. win on appeal. I think they're both going to appeal, but we don't really know where that's going to go. So it is it is pretty. Stunning, and also to be here in Albany and seeing the lawmakers here just still going through the motions like, yes, we're working, we're going to accomplish some yeah. things by the end of the session, it's not bothering us. Ethics reform, well, we've already done quite a bit of that. And, and once again, portraying it, these are two bad apples, there's nothing wrong with the system, which I think at this point a lot of people would disagree you, with that. You have this sense that, you know, that the lawmakers, when they when they come to Albany every week, the first thing they do is check each other for wires at this point, even I mean, even though the, the big guys have gone down. three years of that. Man. There's Still, there's, you know, Preet Bharara keeps saying, stay tuned, stay tuned, and who knows? Who there was a lawmaker there. this week, I remember reading somewhere, uh, a reporter had asked them, oh, what are you guys working on right now? And he said, nothing. Yeah. I mean, right. how, how little are we talking about legislation? Very little. This, yeah. Uh, yeah. here in 2016, I mean, let, let's be honest, this is, this is embarrassing. I mean, we've, the past decade, we've seen a lot of embarrassing uh, episodes here, but in the t past 10 days, we've had the two former legislative leaders mm -hmm. uh, sentenced to prison. We've got trouble here on the second floor. I mean, this is a very We're not, not even time. mentioning the, the investigations yeah. that we spoke about last week yeah. involving Mayor Bill de Blasio. Right. Also, uh, uh, and John being Samson, looked at by Jacob. John Former Samson. Former Democratic conference leader. He's going to be sentenced uh, next, next week. week. I mean, yeah. we're going to have three weeks in a row. This is it's just been a terrible, terrible, well, it's really, it's terrible three years year. within, yeah. Yeah, people um, just seem kind yeah. of kind of stunned by it at this after, point, being in the, in the middle of it. it, it yeah, it, it seems historic. I, I, I want to mention yes. that after the uh, sentence came down in the Skelis case, we had a statement put out by mm -hmm. U.S. Attorney Barrara, and I'll just read a quote. These cases, referring to the cases against Silver and Skelis, show, and history teaches, that the most effective corruption investigations are those that are truly independent and not in danger of either interference or premature shutdown. Karen, who? What could ouch, be referring ouch, to? Ouch, mm -hmm. ouch, ouch, ouch. What a shot at Governor Cuomo. <laughs> yeah. And he's shutting down the Moreland Commission, which Preet Bharara already investigated and said he didn't find any proof of wrongdoing. And now Cuomo's own investigation of what's wrong in his office, where he's trying to steer the narrative and acting like, yes, Preet Bharara and I were working together on this. I have my investigation, he has his. And I think that's probably angered the U.S. attorney, because the U.S. attorney absolutely is not working with somebody whose office is under investigation by him. That is just not happening. You, you wonder if this would have gotten this far if the Moreland Commission had not been shut down, and, and would this have gotten Preet Bharara involved to the extent that he's involved in now, as we were talking before. Basically, he's got a dragnet out over, over the top people in the administration. And 
and boy, what a, what a soap yeah. opera it was yesterday yeah. down in Manhattan for the for the Skelis trial. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Preet Bharara, he was in the courtroom yesterday. Apparently, uh, Gail Skelis, who was Dean's wife, at some point mm -hmm. got so upset that she stood up and I, apparently, according to, to one of the reports, uh, said to that Politico. said to Preet, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, go to hell. He, she she on, said on that to Preet. Out, she said you can out. go to hell. Yeah. Um, and then we, this, uh, Dean's nephew, uh, took the phone from a Daily News reporter and chucked it. Um, after telling a reporter, let's go, um, and he was ended up, he ended up being arrested, and he actually knocked Dean Skellis and his son off the front page of the Daily News. <laughs> you know, little pictures in the bottom uh, right-hand uh, corner, and yeah. this, this kid, uh, it was an embarrassing uh, episode. A lot, lot of acting out by yes. the Skellis yeah. family, as was like revealed the the beautiful. in... beautiful. I mean, it was, it was like a soap opera. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. All right, everyone, stay right where you are. We're just gonna take a quick break. Uh, we're gonna turn things over now to Jenna Flanagan, who has a story on an issue that we've been hearing a lot about in the past few years. Hi, Jenna. Thanks, Casey. Determining the best way to provide health care is an ongoing debate where most of the focus is on doctors, insurance companies, and the price of medications. Some, however, are concerned there's a looming shortage of nurses, starting at the education level. A hands-on career like nursing requires clinical training with patients overseen by a nurse with a master's in science. But nurse educators at the graduate level are a mature and aging group. And as they retire, it leaves fewer and fewer people to teach the next crop of caretakers. It's a crisis. That may sound over the top and dramatic, but for Mary Pat Lewis, Dean of the School of Nursing at SUNY Delhi, a nursing shortage is a very real concern. And it starts with educators. From an academic perspective, all of our faculty have to be prepared at the master's level. Mm -hmm. So it can't be an individual that who has practiced at a high level for many years and we recruit them as faculty. Um, although we value that and we value their expertise, the issue is with accreditation. There are certain credential requirements that we have to have and we have to show evidence. Most colleges require their professors to have at least a master's degree. But in nursing, academia is competing with the almighty dollar. Nurses can see compensation at a much higher level in practice at a graduate level preparation than they can as a nurse educator. And to nursing school deans like Lewis, that's where the crisis starts. With a master's in science for nursing, Lewis says graduates are at the top of their earning power, averaging about $90,000 in practice. That's often tens of thousands over the earning power of a nurse educator, especially one at a small rural SUNY like Delhi. Certainly in education, the money is not the draw. Um, the education itself is the draw, and the value to the profession is the draw and the value to your own personal um, goals and gains. Your, your, your gains are being able to be flexible out in the nursing field and environment. There are different places you can work. Melissa Ackerley is halfway through her studies to earn her master's in nursing, and she plans to teach. But that's after nearly 30 years of clinical work in the field. To become a registered nurse, you have to have an associate's degree, which SUNY Delhi offers. If students choose to do so, they can continue on to earn a bachelor's at the school as well. The problem arises at the master's level. One third of all nurses are at least 50 years old, and with a graduate degree, they can work as an administrator or a nurse practitioner, providing basic health care as well as diagnosis and treatment of chronic or acute conditions. So that's where most people choose to go, leaving a smaller and aging population as professors. As they retire with no one to replace them, it creates a bottleneck of too many undergrad students and not enough grad-level educators. To help correct this problem, Assemblywoman Aileen Gunther has introduced the New York State Nursing Shortage Correction Act. By 2020, the United States will have 193,000 uh, nurses mm -hmm. that are that are needed right now that's what they think the shortage looks like that's a lot of nurses it aims to create recruitment incentive and retention initiatives to help make sure there will always be enough accredited nurse educators we have to put more money into the nursing field and you know what more people have to stand up and support nurses throughout New York State Gunther a registered nurse herself has introduced several bills aimed at supporting nurses including the safe staffing quality care act that would require hospitals to beef up their nursing staff numbers for better patient to caretaker ratios 
Some healthcare providers, like Albany Medical Centers, say they're aware of the potential shortage and have built that into their staffing management. We don't have opportunities where I'm very concerned that, you know, the entire department's getting ready to retire. Uh, there might be a group of people that came together and are working together and, you know, 40, 45 years later are ready to move on together to retirement. Um, and we track that so that we anticipate making sure that we're hiring in and anticipating those changes going forward. Roche says with a shortage in educators, a two-year degree can take as many as three or four years to complete as students wait for an opening in clinical rotations. So I've done my classroom, but I'm literally in a lottery to get those rotations because of the number of master's prepared or doctoral prepared clinicians that can be my faculty instructor and the sites to be able to do that at the bedside. You can only saturate clinical areas so much with students. Albany Medical Center is not a teaching hospital, so staff nurses interested in furthering their education are often referred to nearby schools that offer a master's in science. As a result, Roche says the hospital often looks to hire graduate nursing students from those schools. Still, even at a small school like SUNY Delhi, Dean Mary Pat Lewis says something needs to be done to entice more nurses with a master's in science to choose education. The goal for nursing is to um, add to the body of science of nursing. Um, you know, how to be nurse scholars, how to do research, how to add to that body of literature. Um, how do they function as an advanced practice nurse in a setting that recognizes all of the changes in health policy? Um, how do they be a leader? How do they be a manager? Um, and then once they get to the top courses of the program, what's the role of the nurse educator? To help give them a better edge, Lewis says all of the graduate level nursing faculty are remote. They're recruited from all over the country and teach via WebConnect. They're not required to live in Delhi and can practice at a private facility while they teach. In addition to retiring nurse educators, a significant number of practicing nurses are also expected to age out of the workforce. Between retirements and staffing cutbacks, by 2030, the American Journal of Medical Quality warns the country could have a shortage of nearly one million nurses, and New York State could face a gap of nearly 40,000 needed nurses. Now, let's send it back over to Matt at the desk. All right, thank you, Jenna. We want to know in this week's poll question, how concerned are you about the anticipated nursing shortage in the coming years? Log on and vote. There's the website, nynow.org. Last week, we asked if you thought the legislature would pass additional ethics reforms this year, and our voters were pretty pessimistic. 62% said no. Marlene in the Albany suburb of Colony told us we want change and we want it now, so it behooves the legislature to pass strong ethics reforms now. Ryan in East Chester watching on WNET says they are too busy looking after their own self-interests. Albany politicians and ethics reform is an oxymoron. And finally, Mark in the capital city, if anything, because it's an election year, they'll pass weak, watered-down legislation that will have limited effectiveness, but tout it as landmark ethics legislation. Thanks to all those who voted this week. You can do so at nynow.org, where you can also watch any of our past programs. You'll also find links to us on Facebook, Flickr, and Twitter, where our handle is at nynow underscore PBS. And you'll also find a path to the Capitol Confidential blog run by Casey and his staff, which can also be found at timesunion.com. All right, back at the Reporters' Roundtable on a lighter note, which I think is Finally. badly needed. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Let's point out that coming up on Tuesday, May 24th, we have the 116th Annual Legislative Correspondent Show. Three people at this table uh, are uh, participants, cast members. Mm -hmm. Karen, what can we expect? Well, there's lots of good material. <laughs> Jeez, As I you know, so. you can expect to see a number of the things you've seen in the news played out in song and parody. And I, you know, I think it, it's really cathartic for people, especially when you have all this really bad news about corruption, um, to be able to laugh about it. Maybe the very top people who come to the show might not be laughing as hard, but I know certainly their aides and their staff really appreciate a way to kind yeah, of do. be a little bit lighter about this and, and laugh about 
all the stuff's going on. I can't give too much of a preview because we don't exactly. want to spoil it. You got to be there. I'm, I'm it's an play analog Hillary. event. You got to be there to be part right. of it. That's right. I'm going to be Hillary Clinton. She's provided great uh, female roles for many, many years <laughs> now, and once again, she is. You and played Rick, her a couple of times. Oh, I have. Here. That's right. And Rick's in the show. Who are you playing? I I will be. Uh, Barking and growling. Quite all right. All right. Well, we can't say any more than that. Say. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much to everyone. Karen DeWitt of New York State Public Radio, Rick Carlin of the Times Union, and, of course, Matt Ryan, my partner here at WMHT. All right. Join us next week as we'll review the statewide school budget votes with Tim Creamer of the State School Boards Association. Until then, we leave you with the annual Crayola-like canvas in Albany's Washington Park. With Matt Ryan, I'm Casey Seiler. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you next week right here on your PBS station. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. Additional funding provided by the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation. The Research Foundation for SUNY. People, infrastructure, and technology make SUNY research an engine for New York's innovation economy. www.rfsuny.org. As a bus driver, I'm a very important part of the community. Nothing is more important than the safety of the children. I love the kids. That's what I'm there for, to do my job and deliver them safely and securely.